Uh, so nice to be here. I wish I was with you in person, um, but I'm glad to be here virtually. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit, read a little bit from the book and um, put some pieces of it together and then offer some kind of thoughts that are a bit more contemporary and maybe connect with some of uh, what Ali just said uh, from Ryan's review um, in, in Pytho. Um, but uh, again, thank you, Ali. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited uh, to have received it. And uh, I, your your book is like on my my short stack of stuff to to be reading this spring. So I can't wait to to get into that too. Um, I bet we'll have a lot more to say to each other after I've read yeah. your book. Uh, so um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk through some of these essential arguments. And do feel free to, uh, you know, if I'm sp speaking too quickly or um, you know, if you, you need a point of clarification, just go ahead uh, and, and jump in and, um, you know, again, use the accessibility copy if you, if you need it. Uh, so, a person wearing a Ronald Reagan mask, a black suit, and a long yellow rubber gloves sat casually with his ankles crossed on top of the cab of a beat-up pickup truck driving through the streets of New York. Guards in army green uniforms flanked the truck, donning the same gloves and what looked like N95 masks. The truck pulled a makeshift concentration camp, constructed of bars and razor wire. A watchtower protruded from the center of the camp with yellow images of Reagan's face on all four sides peering out like Big Brother. A multiracial group of prisoners looked out to the street from behind the bars and barbed wire as other marchers watched slowly beside them carrying signs proclaiming silence equals death. This prescient performative protest at the 1987 Pride March was the brainchild of the nascent AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP New York, which wanted to make a powerful statement about AIDS at the annual event. Whether ACT UP members were aware is unclear, but just weeks before the Pride March, the U.S. Senate passed a ban on HIV-positive migrants, preventing them from coming to or legalizing within the United States. Some four years later, the reality the float foreshadowed would come into existence as the United States constructed a quarantine camp for intercepted HIV-positive Haitians who fled political violence after the overthrow of the president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Although ACTIP could not have known that they were actually predicting a future for some HIV positive people, the ominous float made a statement about the severity of the situation for people living with AIDS, not just because opportunistic infections could be deadly, but for the ways that the U.S. government would use the disease as an opportunity to alienize already maligned people like Haitians and homosexuals. In a nation state like the United States, which is founded on the creation and maintenance of a populace, a citizenry that is definitionally expulsive, exterminative, and exclusionary, whether by genocide, lynching, the plantation, the reservation, the ghetto, the internment camp, the prison, the hospital, quarantine, ban, or deportation. Disease becomes one of many opportunities to express this alienizing logic. Disease has historically been an opportunity to express the state's alienizing logic when associated with particular people in the U.S. context, Black, migrant, queer, trans, poor, indigenous, prostitute of color, among others. Regardless of whether they possess U.S. citizenship, these are alienized people, as in they are or easily can be made alien to the nation state. The borders of AIDS is about two expressions of alienizing logic, quarantine and ban, as they manifested in the early days of the AIDS pandemic in the US from 1981 to 1993. Now, despite the quarantines never made much epidemiological or medical sense to address the spread of HIV and AIDS, quarantine's centrality to the public imagination is evident in wide ranging calls for it, extensive fears of it, and its proliferation in AIDS discourse almost since the inception. Eventually, such rhetoric materialized in state-level quarantine laws that often emerged in response to the behaviors of supposedly recalcitrant Black sex workers. Such expressed concerns about the movement of quote-unquote fugitive Black bodies is a narrative, of course, as old as the days of fugitive slavery in the United States. 
The alienizing logic refined during these frenzied calls for quarantine manifested in one way with widespread passing of laws that criminalize HIV, which has disproportionately impacted black men. Although quarantine never became a law or set of laws applied to HIV positive citizens in mass, rhetorics of quarantine manifested in another way by animating the 22 year long US ban on HIV positive migrants, which was only lifted in 2010. My book tells a story about how public health officials, politicians, media, and others applied alienizing logic to people living with AIDS in the form of quarantine and ban rhetorics and how some of those most impacted fought back. But to understand the story I wanna tell, I must first briefly explain what I mean by alienizing logic. So a logic is a structure of thinking that thereby structures expression. A, a logic can be expressed in innumerable ways by countless actors or entities, but who deploys a logic results in different impacts, right? So uh, uh, a logic can emerge from numerous, even competing belief systems or ideologies. And now what I described as an alienizing logic references a structure of thinking, which insists that some are necessarily members of a community and some are recognized as not belonging, even if they physically reside there. The alien outside, of course, is not a simple dichotomy constituted by a firm boundary between two easily identifiable positions. And the book addresses three primary definitions of alien uh, to show th that those rendered alien are not merely foreign, right? So an alien can re refer to a, a person who does not belong, a person who is separated or excluded from, or a person who or thing which is opposed, repugnant, or unaccustomed to. Right? So those are kind of the three main definitions. In real life, these definitions are perpetually blended together, even if in particular contexts, one understanding dominates. In each case, to be rendered alien involves a relationship between two or more ent entities and involves a recognition by one or more of those entities of a person as an alien. Now, taken together, these definitions provide a framework to begin to understand how alienizing logic works. To only juxtapose the alien with the citizen implies thinking of the alien only in its le legal register as a foreign migrant. And that is a part of a divide and conquer strategy that denies a fuller meaning of alienage. The state and other official entities apply alienizing logic to citizens and migrants. The logic may manifest differently. Genocide, lynching, the plantation, the reservation, the ghetto, the internment camp, the prison, the hospital, quarantine ban or deportation. Fundamentally, those with inalienable rights have the power to alienize and those without them do not, right? So like many other diseases, Stockdale writes of HIV AIDS that it has always been a problem that has severely affected those at the intersections of multiple oppressions, homophobia, racism, sexism, and classism in particular. His claim is important because while illness can technically afflict anyone, extreme health disparities exist between the structurally privileged and those who reside in the intersections of structural oppression. Disease can manifest because of structural oppression and disease can become an opportunity to exacerbate structural oppression through what I'm calling alienizing logic. Fundamentally, using disease or fear of disease as an opportunity to enact alienizing logic has been racialized and usually is racist. Uh, mm -hmm. Susan L. Smith notes, for example, that in the antebellum United States, many white Southerners believed that if Black people became sick, it was because of an inherently weaker constitution. At the same time, that physicians maintained that uh, often African Americans were more resistant than white people to certain diseases, such as yellow fever and malaria. Either way you cut it, Black people's relationship to disease was one of the many factors white people used to alienize them. And such logics continue to the present day uh, where many continue to believe that supposed Black inferiority explains health disparities. Um, and of course, uh, other groups suffered too. Um, you know, and, and for my argument, I, I think one of those big groups is, is, is migrants. Um, you know, Howard Markle and Alexandra Minister note, for example, consistent pattern in US American history of stigmatizing migrants as the etiology of a wide variety of physical and societal ills. 
And we can see such a pattern in historic practices at, at U.S. ports, right, where uh, migrants would be undressed and scrutinized or deloused with kerosene, um, all sorts of these kinds of behaviors. And so from the arrival of the first ships carrying stolen Africans to the relevant, re relatively present day, migrants have been quarantined to ensure their fitness to the nation. And examples are virtually endless and continue well into the 21st century. Now, I want to also just briefly say that my book doesn't minimize the fact that in the United States, most of our histories of HIV AIDS are about white U.S. citizen gay men or that men who have sex with men continue to have a disproportionate impact in the U.S. from HIV and AIDS. But my book emerges from a shared concern with Michelle Tracy Berger, who emphasizes the obstacles faced by those living with HIV who face multiple axes of oppression or what she calls intersectional stigma. The concerns of those experiencing intersectional stigma differ from those living with AIDS who hold relative privilege based on race, class, or gender. And my ex concern extends a little bit further in that I'm interested in how immigration and citizenship status matter as additional sites of power and oppression that impact people's experiences with HIV AIDS and the ways, again, that AIDS becomes an opportunity to enact this alienizing logic. So. From here, I'm going to move into a discussion of how the alienizing logic of quarantine manifested in the U.S. and calls to quarantine people in the U.S. who had AIDS. From very early days, public health and medical professionals had the information before them that unlike air or saliva-borne infections like tuberculosis, AIDS was not casually communicable. Nevertheless, the question of quarantine was prominent in debates about how to prevent the spread of AIDS through much of the 1980s. Now, the loudest of these voices came from the far right, including figures like Jerry Falwell of the Moral Majority, Orange County Republican Congressman, the late William Dannemeyer, uh, and right-wing fringe figure, uh, Lyndon LaRouche. Yet, serious considerations of quarantine filled the pages of dozens of law reviews, found their ways to the editorial pages of major publications, the surveys of prominent pollsters, the drafting tables of state public health officials and legislators. Some even suggested that the CDC quietly laid plans in preparation for a mass quarantine of people with AIDS. It's important to note that past quarantines in the United States most adversely affected communities imagined outside of the proper white citizenry, including sex workers and migrants. Although others might have been afflicted and on occasion the reach extended further, the most well-known and documented quarantines in U.S. history targeted these already dehumanized groups that lacked political, racial, and economic power. Now, in the early years of AIDS, although calls to quarantine seemed to be about the most visibly maligned group in the U.S., so gay men, the reality played out much differently. The rash calls to quarantine at state and local levels that manifested from the rhetorical furor around AIDS across the U.S. manifested on the back of Black sex workers, some who were also gay men. And I'm just going to share one story um, from the book here that I think is among the most poignant of the, of the stories in the book. <clears throat> so in 1985, the, the uh, Texas State Health Commissioner, a guy named Robert Bernstein, put forth a proposal, uh, a quarantine proposal, that would have given state or local health officials the power to confine any person with AIDS who was deemed a public health threat because they'd not, they would not stop engaging in risky activities. Now, Bernstein made this call in light of the infamous and, and tragic life of an alleged black male sex worker uh, in Houston named Fabian K. Bridges. The details of Bridges' life are contested. The gay press paints a radically different picture than the mainstream media. And of course, it's not surprising that the, the reports uh, conflict. The, those conflicting reports in a sensational documentary help to articulate how a quote-unquote incorrigible gay man alleged to be a sex worker ends up at the center of the AIDS quarantine debate. So according to the press, Bridges' story came to the attention of public health officials as a result of a Minneapolis-based news crew from WCCO-TV that came to Houston in the summer of 1985 to learn about the gay community's struggles after the defeat of an employment referendum that would have protected gays and lesbians had it passed. That story apparently didn't prove to be very interesting, but producers learned about Bridges, a black gay man with AIDS struggling with poverty and homelessness. 
And their recordings became a documentary, um, which some might remember, which was then aired as part of a PBS Frontline episode called AIDS, a National Inquiry in 1986. Now, before Bridges was diagnosed with AIDS, he worked a stable job paying $19,000 a year at the Harris County Flood Authority. But after his diagnosis, he got sick and entered a hospital, soon losing his housing and job. At the time the news crew arrived, Bridges was not actually even in Houston. After making his way to Indianapolis to try to seek help from his sister and brother-in-law, who would not take him in, but affectionately called him by his middle name, Calvin, he ran into trouble with law enforcement for allegedly stealing a bicycle. Knowing he has AIDS, instead of filing charges against him, a judge and law enforcement officers purchased him a bus ticket to Cleveland where his mother lived. So the news crew went to locate him there where they followed him as he tried to connect with his mother, whose husband would not let Bridges stay with her. Bridges struggled to find other housing since no shelters would take him. He eventually ended up in a hotel room paid for by the Red Cross as he waited for his social security disability payments to begin. Now, Houston's Montrose Voice, a gay publication bearing the name of Houston's gayberhood, Montrose, reported that the news crew regularly paid Bridges for lodging and food in order to continue filming. When Bridges told them he continued to have sex, the crew reported him to Cleveland public health officials. Bridges eluded the film crew and returned to Houston, reportedly to pick up a van he owned to take back to Cleveland. <laughs> Eventually, Bridges needed money, so he contacted the film crew, which then followed him to Houston. While in Houston, he visited a doctor and told the doctor he continued to have sex, reportedly with at least 20 people. That doctor notified the health department office. And in late September, Bridges was placed under police monitoring in order to quit having sex. Apparently, Bridges initially said he refused the order, prompting an outcry over this incorrigible, supposedly AIDS victim, and a two-day police hunt for Bridges where police tried to entrap him into having sex. That tactic didn't work, so they arrested him for public urination. An actual violation of his order would have been a third-degree felony punishable by 10 years in prison and a $5,000 fine. Media relished the story. On October 5th of that year, two doctors who had treated Bridges at different hospitals, one of whom had urged that he be given a quarantine warning, issued a statement defending their actions with Bridges and assuring that their actions were, quote, not anti-homosexual, but pro-health. The one who requested the quarantine warning, a white male physician, Robert Aw, stated, I requested that this quarantine warning be served on Mr. Bridges because he was alone, confused, and frightened and obviously needed help. He had repeatedly refused the attempts by discharge planners, social workers, and myself to be placed in a boarding house. He preferred to be a quote unquote, independent street person. Now the full text of that statement is not available. So we can't contextualize the rest of the physician's comments, but this excerpt is significant. Issued just days after a police manhunt for bridges and the city health director's order to stop having sex, Dr. Aw suggested his call for quarantine emerged from his humanitarian pity and concern. Because Bridges was alone and in need of assistance, Dr. Aw called for his isolation. Aw juxtaposed his rational pastoral care with Bridges' irrational desire to be independent and to remain on the street. Throughout his ordeal, Bridges ended up in Time Magazine and repeatedly in Houston local media. And these Depictions as in the frontline documentary, few even question whether Bridges was okay, instead insisting he was clearly demented and needed to be confined to a mental institution. Diego Lopez, a clinical director for gay men's health crisis and the only person of color or person living with AIDS on that frontline experts panel, was the only one who expressed concern for Bridges, noting that the depictions of him were racist and homophobic and that Bridges was victimized by all the systems that failed him. And as Judy Woodruff, the host of the documentary noted, the gay community soon kind of just then began protecting Bridges from all mainstream press. On the advice of people from the gay community, including Houston's well-known white gay activist, Ray Hill, Bridges voluntarily entered a hospital in early October, then lived with friends for a short time before dying in a hospital on November 17th, 1985, and being buried in a pauper's grave because his family had no money for a funeral. 
that public health officials created hysteria over the need to quarantine bridges just six weeks before he died is telling. Friends and supporters reported that he was six foot two, 126 pounds, and suffering from genital and rectal herpes before he died. As one friend put it, I feel he could not have given it away, let alone sold it. The public affairs director at WCCO, which followed Bridges for the documentary, admitted that his crew did not know whether Bridges lied about his sexual activity in order to get food and shelter from reporters. They also denied that Bridges was a prostitute. For Bridges' part, he seemed to have little sense that his story would be taken up in the exploitative way that it was. At the end of the documentary, filmmakers showed a clip of Bridges sitting in his Cleveland hotel room, wearing a black t-shirt and speaking in a soft voice. We don't know what he's been asked, but he, he says, let me go down in history as being, I am somebody, somebody that'll be respected, somebody who's appreciated, somebody who can be related to. There's a whole lot of people who just go. They're not even on the map. They just go. So what I'm trying to do in the book is to tell a story about how fears and beliefs about racialized sexuality and particularly how anti-blackness were at the root of many US responses to HIV AIDS in the early years of the pandemic. Uh, and, and I mean today as well, right? And this has global implications. Uh, as Jennifer Breyer suggests, while policymakers rarely spoke of race directly, images of people of color as sources of contagion suffused the public language spoken in Washington. And particularly fears of African and Haitian migrants were infused into every aspect of AIDS discourse in the United States. This meant that among US citizens, black folks suffered the most dire consequences of alienizing logic as it manifests within calls to quarantine. But a group that is rarely named in histories of HIV and AIDS, migrants also endured dire consequences. In the fall of 1985, this is exactly the time when what's happening with Bridges is all over the media. The calls for quarantine in public, concerns about age have reached a fever pitch. At the time, Acting Health and Human Services Secretary James O. Mason proposed an initial rule for the Federal Register that would change the definition of dangerous and contagious disease by adding AIDS to it for the purposes of immigration law. Um, which is something that um, I have a whole chapter about how that actually comes to be. Thus, the targeting and isolating of people living with AIDS that outside of prisons never fully flourishes in relation to U.S. citizen communities is given sound shape as immigration policy. What a lot of people don't know is that the first time that the full U.S. Senate debated AIDS policy, it was in relation to the ban on HIV positive immigrants. Now, a ban and a quarantine are not exactly the same practices, but they mo both emerge from alienizing logic. Furthermore, a ban that prevents some people from coming to the U.S. or regulating their status if they were already here can have similar effects as a quarantine, right? Isolation, exclusion, stigmatization. Now, by 1988, the United States had more reported AIDS cases than the entire rest of the world combined, totaling nearly 60% of known cases. Fingers pointed from the United States to Africa and Haiti as the culprits. Now, surely cases in some countries were underreported, but by the available numbers, whether HIV originated in the United States, this country was a principal breeding ground for its spread. Most of the world regarded the United States as the primary exporter of HIV AIDS. Nevertheless, key members of the Reagan administration and the US Congress supported and advocated passing laws to exclude those with HIV from migrating to this country in order to supposedly stop the spread of HIV here. This came to a head when many of the same people like Senator Jesse Helms and Representative Dannemeyer, who had long been calling for the quarantine of US citizens living with HIV and AIDS, turned their attention to immigration policy. In 1987, Helms proposed an amendment to a supplemental appropriations bill to add HIV and AIDS to the list of dangerous and contagious diseases. And this, um, even though there was much debate, the Senate unanimously approved it and Reagan signed it into law. Now, both presidents Bush and Clinton agreed that they were going to get rid of this provision because virtually no one believed that it made sense from a public health perspective. Nevertheless, the law was codified by the Senate in 1993, while hundreds of allegedly HIV positive Haitian migrants who fled political persecution were held 
in concentration camp conditions on Guantanamo because the discriminatory law prevented them from having their cases heard. <clears throat> As one of the imprisoned Haitians, 28 year old Emma Verdue put it, one thing I've noticed since the beginning of history is that white people have been trying to create another planet where they can put us in order to separate us. I think they're trying to create that planet now and they are starting with the Haitians. The story of this so-called Haitian connection to HIV and AIDS is a long one, part of which I also detail in the book, but it fully exemplifies the anti-Blackness inherent in the way the U.S. used AIDS as an opportunity to enact its alienizing logic. Now, 1982, the CDC first designated those at high risk, colloquially, right, the 4-H club, homosexual men, Haitians, hemophiliacs, and heroin users. The separate designation of Haitians proved highly controversial because they're the only national group marked at high risk. And of course, Haiti was already maligned in the public sphere at this point. With, with that designation, Haitian community and political groups, although of course acknowledging that Haitians had been affected, denounced their singling out. And Haitians in both countries, Haiti and the United States, really felt the impact of the stigmatization. The Haitian, the Haitian tourist industry was completely decimated by 1983. Now the detention of the HIV positive Haitians on Guantanamo is one of the most repugnant and horrific implications of the HIV ban. And it was the logical outcome of the U.S. approach to AIDS. The detained Haitians, along with Haitian groups and AIDS activist groups in the U.S., fought their detention. And those on Guantanamo were also, of course, very politically active and had met the requirements for asylum, so they were all very well organized. In fact, while the Senate debated whether to codify the ban in February 1993, the Haitians detained in Guantanamo were in the middle of a hunger strike. They constantly protested their conditions and confinement and were treated brutally by US military officials charged with their care. In late, 1990, uh, in late 1993 or early 1993, sorry, over 300 Marines in full riot gear descended on the sleeping refugees in a military operation. The soldiers arrested 31 refugees, including a seven year old boy. Women were subjected to vaginal searches. The camp was overrun with rats and vermin. One advocate for the Haitians explained how the Haitians understood their plight. If we were really sick, we'd be in hospitals. We wouldn't be treated this way as prisoners. You could see they're not being treated as sick people. They've been assaulted. They've been harassed the whole time they've been in there. They've been thrown in jail, a jail within the jail, and mistreated in several ways. And when they're sick and they bring it to the attention of the doctors, they don't get the medical attention they need. Haitians would only finally be sent to the United States when they were on their deathbeds. For example, 26-year-old Joel, Joel Santil, a first-year first year medical student when he fled Haiti, died only eight days after being released from Guantanamo. 200 rageful Haitian protesters took his body to the INS office in Miami to vividly show his death was the government's fault. Salisi's success is three-month-old three -month son, Ricardo, had developed pneumonia on the base, which is what prompted officials to send success and her son to the Walter Reed Military Hospital in the US. After Tiny Ricardo died, authorities promptly sent success to the Barrick Street Detention Center in Manhattan, which was the site of regular protests against Haitian imprisonment. The Haitians were only finally released when in June 1993, a judge ordered it. Upon finally being released into the United States, 22-year-old Westner de Rossier told a Stonewall News reporter that he often wondered if he should have stayed in Haiti, even though he and his brother were involved in Aristide's presidential campaign and were no longer safe. He said that while he was incarcerated, quote, I used to think of an old proverb, it's better to die as a tiger than as a dog. Haitians were horrifically dehumanized on Guantanamo Bay, but their freedom dreams continued. Reunited with his fiance, de Rossier hoped, I would like to be somebody to be a light for society. Ferrar Jean Bernard, 35, shared the sentiment. <clears throat> More than anything else, I want to take something, I want to make something of myself. I want to learn something and take it back to my brothers and sisters in Haiti and my children. I don't want my kids to go through what I went through. Even success continued chasing her freedom dreams. She said, even though I lost my mother, father, and baby, 
I think of what Aristide said. Together, we are strong. I still feel I cannot be discouraged because together as Haitians, we are strong. But within a decade, more than half of those who had been imprisoned at Guantanamo were dead. I don't mean to gloss over these events as quickly as I have. Um, I encourage you to read about them more fully in my book or in books like Naomi Pake's Rightlessness. The larger point I wanna make today is that powerful countries like the US use disease as an opportunity to enact alienizing logic. Um, alienizing logic is deadly. It's incumbent upon those of us committed to justice in many forms to take seriously the role of disease and serving as a rationale for necropolitical agendas, something I'm sure I don't need to convince this audience of. And even more than that, it's necessary we take seriously how disease is always constituted through racialized sexuality. One only needs to think about our present moment. And here we kind of return to, to where Ali started, right, in, in some ways. Um, you know, in late 2021 in the U.S., we were inundated with harrowing images of U.S. Border Patrol agents and Texas Rangers on horseback rounding up Haitian asylum seekers near Del Rio, Texas, and reportedly using whips to do so. In a country founded on slavery, U.S. officials whipping Black people should give anyone pause, but these particular Black people are being targeted by the Biden administration using a March 2020 Trump era order from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, allowing the use of Title 42 of the U.S. Code. In Title 42, Section 265, the federal government, and specifically the CDC, is allowed during threat of, quote, communicable disease to prohibit in whole or part the introduction of persons and property from such countries or places as he shall designate in order to avert such danger and for such period of time as he may deem necessary for such purpose, blah, blah, blah. Trump and now Biden have chosen to apply this to anyone arriving from Mexico or Canada because such people would arrive at ports of entry in ways that would introduce them to a, quote, congregate setting. Trump and now Biden reasoned that such settings put migrants in a situation in which the spread of COVID-19 would be imminent, even while public health officials outside of the government have repeatedly said that applying public health principles like masks, social distancing, or processing people outdoors or in spaces with good ventilation would make better public health sense than deporting people, many who have a credible fear of political persecution. Yet, in an interview last fall, Department of Homeland Security Secretary uh, Alejandro Mayorkas continued to defend the Biden administration, saying, it is currently our government's intention to continue to exercise our Title 42 authority in light of the public health imperative as determined by the Centers for Disease Control. Although this current U.S. government-induced crisis may seem outrageous to some, Title 42, which is being used disproportionately against Haitians in recent memory, is the exact same provision that led to the imprisonment of Haitians that I've been talking about. And so this is why I think we have to talk about something like alienizing logic, because I believe it's a way for us to pull events that might otherwise seem sort of disparate into something more coherent and designed. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. I look forward to your questions and, and, and your comments. Thank you, Dr. Chavez. Um, I just want to highlight, I put a few things in the chat. Um, one would be a link to Dr. Chavez's book, if you want to check that out, um, that is linkable. Another is the access copy of Dr. Chavez's talk today. So if you um, popped in a little bit late, no big deal, you can kind of catch up um, by checking out that access copy. And then I also um, put in a link to Naomi Pike's book, um, Rightlessness, that you referenced about if folks want to learn more about um, the Haitian migrant crisis in Guantanamo um, and some of her work there. Um, I want to open things up to folks on the floor to see if you have questions to get us started. I know it's always hard to be the first person to ask a question after a talk like this. Um, feel free to pop a question into um, the chat box. Uh, Alexis says that um, they have to log off, but thanks for speaking with us, Karma. So they're grateful for your talk today. Something that um, I was thinking about, I have no problem asking the first question. Something that I was thinking about just towards the very end when you asked us to come back to this, this idea of alienizing logic as something that will help us 
think about disparate events as actually not disparate at all, but but part of um, the same sort of project is how much is alienizing logic, particularly American, and how much do we see in other parts of the world? So, for instance, is the same logic happening in the Ukraine right now? And I'm, I might be asking you to speak up things that like are really not within your expertise, but I'm wondering how much of this is like a, a very particular American thing, and then how much of it is spreading elsewhere? Yeah, it's. A, I mean, it's an important question. It, I, I mean, the truth is, I think you see this in different iterations all over. I mean, I think the 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 very concept of the nation state as one example. I mean, it, it it's premised on this in a certain sense. Um, you know, does it manifest in the same way all the time? No, but I think um, you know, it's it, it it's the deep structure. Uh, of of the kind of nation state structure we exist in, and, and you know, that's where my um, knowledge as a scholar kind of ends. Like I don't know a lot about um, pre nation state configurations. I'm sure it was there too. So one might say maybe that it's just um, something that is you know regularly seen uh, uh, among humans and groups. Um, so. I'm interested in it in the US context simply because that's what my kind of area of interest is. I think you could see it elsewhere. I think what is helpful for me in the US context and part of what I do in the book is I really, I, I, I go back to kind of like, um, you know, early Republic um, thinking. I mean, I, I do a thing in the conclusion um, that's kind of oh, it's about Abraham Lincoln. It probably <laughs> seems like it makes no sense to people, but I'm trying to kind of just show it's it's been there all along. Um, so yeah, that's a rambling answer to your question. Yeah, it's, so it's not new. I mean, I actually I liked the conclusion and how you went back to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, I like to think about John Locke when I think about HIV. So I mean, yeah. these things are like are what's old is also not that old, right? When we sort of think about where these ideas come from. Do other folks have some questions that you want to voice or put in the chat box? I have or Rebecca? A I think that's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Becca. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your, your talk. Um, and I was struck when you were telling the story about bridges, I started to think about the role that labels like non-compliance in the medical system play in in the application of these these alienating logics, because of course that that label of non-compliant is so inequitably distributed, um, and so mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could speak on that for for a moment. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an important question, and I think um, what what's interesting to me is how labels like non-compliance or you know recalcitrant or, or the, you know these other kind of words that might get used. Um, you know, how, how they also play out in predictable ways, right? Um, and so, you know, I even think about, like, my sister is a physician, and, um, you know, she's dealing with uh, a lot of non-compliant people right now around COVID-19 living in rural Nebraska. And, um, you know, she's had to challenge her uh, colleagues a lot, because if it's, like, a uh, like a Latina who comes in, that's about all it is, is white and Latino there, um, you know, the who has questions, concerns about um, vaccine, for example, because of stuff she, you know, people have concerns. Um, you know, there's 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 no patience whatsoever for her noncompliance. But these old white guys who are Trumpites and jackasses, um, you know, my sisters like had to call out the the people she supervises. Um, and so I think to me, that's part of what is is interesting is the, that's a, just another example of how we see things that could be, you know, applied in a neutral way. Mm -hmm. Art. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really great um, connection to make Becca to this idea of non-compliant as one of these labels and how particularly if you live what's considered kind of a, a messy life, a life that um, has a lot of migration in it, whether it's because you're not documented or because you're just poor and you move a lot, right? How that gets sort of uh, a sloppy label gets sort of placed on you um, 
and non-compliance certainly comes up a lot in the work that I do as well. I know that we have a few of our fabulous undergrads here on this call. And I think um, one of the things that I'm curious about, um, much of, of your book was um, really helpful for me as somebody who thinks a lot about HIV. It was helpful for me um, in showing me new lenses, but I didn't really honestly know very much about the Haitian Guantanamo um, containment. Um, it was something I kind of knew in the back of my head, but it's never something that got a lot of attention in the work and the things that I read. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you realized that story was going to be a part of this book, right? And then how you went about investigating it. Like what, how did you learn what you learned and was it difficult? And also you said, you know, within a couple of years, 50% of the people who were there had already passed away. So how much are we able to talk to survivors? Are there survivors? Uh, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I think this is a, this is a, a, a great question about origin stories and methodology. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> how, like, I didn't know about it either. I didn't know about the Haitian attention and how this came to be was I was invited to contribute to the special issue of a special issue of a journal that's very prominent in my field, the quarterly journal of speech on the 25th anniversary of ACT UP. And, you know, when you're invited to do something as you do, you like slap together an abstract, set it off, and then, you know, it comes back and you have to do this thing. And so I was like, oh, I want to do something about immigration, you know, and I saw like, just Google real quick. And I, I find this little, um, like short article that of course, dumb kid doesn't even save. And it says something about Haitians, uh, you know, uh, building coalitions with, with ACT UP because of this tension. And I thought, oh, so I write this, you know, little 200 word abstract. And then uh, I, you know, I assume if I found that article so quickly, there's lots out there on this thing. Well, then, you know, it's about time to write this piece. And uh, I start, you know, doing the Google search, like all good uh, scholars start with, right? Or average scholars, uh, <laughs> as it were. Um, and I can't find anything. And then I start kind of like freaking out. So then I like, you know, go into some news databases and then I find out more about the detention. So then I'm like, okay, so learning about that, but through like mainstream media. And then at some point I, I find someone from ACT UP that's actually like quoted in a news article. And then I was like, okay. And I'm a really, I'm a, I'm a rhetoric scholar, which means I should be good at archival research, but I'm, I'm like, I'm not really that great um, at, in general at research. So I talked to somebody who, uh, you know, says, well, you know, ACT UP's archives are, they're like housed somewhere, like they're in New York. And I was like, oh, so I don't even, think I should just check at the University of Wisconsin libraries to see if there's like a copy there. I like buy a plane ticket, go to New York. Well, I registered with a library first, thankfully, but I get there and I found um, a bunch of materials there that mostly were at Wisconsin where I was, but um, few weren't. <laughs> and so I, um, you know, I, I, I get, the materials there and that became the basis um for that short article but then it also became the basis for the chapter and you know i don't um i don't speak haitian creole i don't read it um i am not um uh, connected to haitian communities um and so how i what i did is one relied on these act up archives i looked into all the other um english language haitian archives that I could find in the US, there was virtually nothing that was of, of use to me in any of those other archives that I found. Although of course there, uh, there is an archive that did have material that I just missed because you always find that after you finish a book. Um, but what I did is every single quotation that I could find from someone who was detained, I pulled that because I wanted in that chapter for their voices to be central the best that I could do it and so that was kind of the sort of scavenger methodology that I used was to just centralize black Asian voices 
uh, oh. wherever I could find them from. Um, which is, is uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Um, so very oh. hard. Yes, it sounds hard. Um, and I was wondering about that language, if there would be a language barrier as well. Um, and I'm wondering, um, there's a question from my student here, but I just wanted to ask just a really quick follow up question, which is, has anything about how you told the story um, changed since you've written the book? Like, have you learned new things that you wish you would have included because you people have come forward or sort of disclosed more information or? That's a really, really smart question. Um, not yet. No one has. Um, I mean, one of my students did alert me of, of an archive that exists that I, I don't know. I didn't find. Um, and I looked at it. And I didn't. I didn't see any information that I didn't already have another version of. Um, so so far that hasn't happened. But um, I anticipate that that could happen. Um, it certainly, I think, did with uh, my previous book. Yeah, I'm, I would be curious. I mean, your book's still so fresh that I would wonder um, over the next couple of years if there'll be folks that are like, oh, I have information from my family history or I have information from my community that could be useful. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, my soon, uh, who is one of our fabulous professors here at UT, um, says, thank you for your talk. Really looking forward to reading your book and appreciated the story you told about bridges. Um, and there's a question mark. Um, is it bridges like bridges to an ocean or bridge, bridges over water? Is that how you spell it? Okay. Yeah. Especially in relation to the criminalization of people living with HIV AIDS. I wonder if that's a topic you develop further in the book and maybe what more you can say about the way in which PWAs were getting persecuted for having sex, even safe sex. Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, you know, I, 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 I am talking about criminalization in a certain sense in the book, right? About HIV criminalization. Um, but I'm, I end up going in kind of the direction where I talk about Bridges, a few other of the kind of initial cases of individuals who were targeted with quarantine um, provisions. And then I kind of move to, um, rather than how that ends up playing out more fully, I move to the immigration question. Um, and part of that is because there's such excellent work out there already. Um, Stephen Thrasher and, you know, Trevor Hoppy to name a few who uh, have really, um, I think done, you know, pretty elaborate work on the criminalization of HIV. Uh, Ryan Conrad is another one, my, my collaborator. So, um, I don't. I don't end up going as much into it. Um, I mean, I recognize it and talk briefly about it. But doesn't don't go as much into it in the book, um, but certainly those other scholars or folks uh, that should be read on the on this subject. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it's one that um, I'll be talking with one of my classes um, after break. We're reading. Um, the Great Americans about the HIV crisis in Chicago. Um, and when we go, I know from when I taught before that teaching about the history of HIV is, is tricky um, for younger folks who don't have memories of the 80s or the, or the 90s or even the early 2000s, right? And, and to sort of, sort of bring out this moment of like such fear um, around yeah. this virus, but it's getting different now that we have another sort of way to sort of think about a scary virus where we don't know how it's, you know, passed on yeah. long term effects are. So um, I think that's an interesting question about like, it seems like, oh, well, why that seems so irrational that you would criminalize people for having sex if it's safe sex and how could you possibly and and it's like, but in 1985, you know, there was there was a different moment, I think. Yeah. But, and, yeah. But you get people who are, you know, criminalized even up into, you know, the last, you know, probably today, right? Too. I mean, in a certain sense, that it's like that has continued even safe sex isn't safe sex. If someone is imagined to, you know, be not just have, but be a pathogen, right? To be pathogenic. Um, but some, you know, stuff I'm really thinking right now a little bit about um, the, the, you know, sexually transmitted infection or disease, right? We think about that as a phrase a lot and then you know we have COVID now um which is not a sexually transmitted infection and you know it's not thought of in that way but i what i've been really thinking about is um intimacy and so you know because a lot of people of course are asking me to kind of make comparisons between COVID and hiv which you know um we could talk about but 
what what I'm interested, I think, more so in that is in questions of intimacy. So intimately transmitted disease, intimately transmitted infection, um, you know, breathing another's air, uh, and and how is it that that um, is differently stigmatized, or how is how is it that that isn't framed as you know? Um, a problem in the same way, but it's a problem in a different way. I, I don't have anything real concrete about it yet because I'm really just been thinking about what that means mm -hmm. as people have asked me those questions. But um, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that that's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah, and I know that there's been some special calls out there for um, special issues around thinking about HIV in times of COVID and vice versa. And so there are people are starting to like mold this question over, um, mm -hmm. though sort of I think it's more of like for thought as a thought experiment um, than in some sort of other concrete way. Joey, you have a question? I do. Thank you so much. This has been so um, I mean, moving, but also intellectually stimulating. Um, I, a brief comment to Ellie's question earlier about alienizing logics and other times and places. I work on 16th and 17th century Europe, um, and the stakes of this example are, are quite different than the stakes of the examples you gave. But um, all across Europe in the 17th century, syphilis was known as the French disease. Mm. Um, so there's like an example of like a quite old alienizing logic. Um, I, but I was curious about, I really am taken with the phrase that you just used about thinking about like intimately transmitted diseases or infections. And, um, you know, cause one of the things that I was taking away from your reading of, of the Bridges story in particular is that, I mean, it seems like implicit in the argument you're making is that, you know, we all have fundamental rights to bodily autonomy and sovereignty right and that that's part of the thing it's you know there's the alienizing logic of like him being incorrigible um that's clearly as you say sort of drawn together like you know racism and, and sexism um, or and homophobia um but also that like just as a fundamental issue like people have a right to bodily sovereignty right and so that that's what in some ways the sort of quarantine orders were withholding that right from him or taking it away forcefully from him um, but, but phrasing this as like, into, I was thinking about that because I was thinking about COVID of course, right? Also, and, yeah. and how people have made arguments to bodily sovereignty and autonomy that are in some ways legitimately, like legitimately do pose a threat to public health, right? That that has mm -hmm. been, in fact, the arguments that people have been making against masks and vaccines and that are, mm -hmm. that are difficult to see. It's difficult to see those logics converge because on, mm -hmm. on in certain situations they feel particularly politically progressive and other situations they don't but I, I i would love to hear you say a little bit more about your thinking here about intimacy because it seems to me that now that you've used that phrase i, I hadn't thought of it in this way but one of the things that you were saying i think in that reading of bridges is not just that people have fundamental rights to bodily autonomy and sovereignty but that maybe there is some sort of fundamental right to intimacy Right, because the, the the question at issue there was not just like his ability to go anywhere he wanted to, but to have sex with other people, mm -hmm. um, and that that feels new and radical to me in some ways as a concept. Right, to to say that we have a right to intimacy that that should not be infringed upon by, I don't know, a state, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God, there's so much rich there. Thank you for that. Um, you just get me. You're like making me think in so many directions. Um, gosh, yeah, I mean, to your point about kind of bodily sovereignty and how these arguments get deployed in, in different moments in different contexts, right? And, and so can you make a normative argument about body, bodily sovereignty? Um, and, and, and I think that on the one hand, I mean, we're thinking about that in Texas right now, as you know, the, the good old governor wants, uh, you know, trans kids to receiving care to be treated as child abuse cases. Um, but, you know, I, I, on the one hand, um, I think disease creates this question in, in a different way or illness creates, raises this question in, in a different way. Um, because, and this is where I'm thinking a lot about breath too, because, you know, are there ways, I mean, I don't know, I'm going to get myself in all sorts of circles here. I don't have a good answer to your question, but I'm going to write it down after I get off this call and think through it, because it really is making me think. And I'd love to um, continue the conversation with you offline. Um, 
Yeah, Karma, that's Joey Gamble, and you can find him at the University of Toledo. <laughs> in the English I'm going to come after you, Joey. <laughs> um, I also, I just want to say th the question had me thinking about some conversations and disability studies around uh, what Mia Mingus calls access intimacy and how like so much of that conversation around access um, has been about public spaces, but what about sexual access and access intimacy um, and the states? Is, I think it's different from this conversation around HIV and sexuality, but I do think there's an overlap there that's interesting around like what what does it mean to access sexuality if you're somebody with um, complicated Im impairments that that requires more access um, assistance. I think we have another question from Becca. Thinking also about intimacy is necessary in care work, making some disabled people and care workers, largely women of color, particularly vulnerable to COVID. Yeah, like thinking about those who are more susceptible to COVID. Um, and also wondering about this idea of shame too um, in COVID. Like now we're like, oh, you got COVID and you're like an old white guy, you must be a Trump supporter, right? And right. now, you know, but before it was like, you know, a lot of the folks that were getting COVID were care workers and poor care workers yeah. without access to safety measures. Yeah, I mean, there's so much there you think about, you know, who 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 has, the right to care and who is expected to just give care, mm -hmm. um, who has, you know, and then the, just thinking back a little bit what Joey's talking about, like, you know, who, who has um, the right to have intimacy, but who does not have the right to not have intimacy through yeah. care work. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. There is, yeah, there's some interesting stuff there around how stigma also circulates in relation to um, who gets to have intimacy or privacy. Like um, Dorothy mm -hmm. Roberts talks about privacy as a as a white privilege, right? This idea. Yeah. Of privacy. So I think there's there's lots of cool stuff that we could think about. Uh, ooh, someone just put in the chat. What do we got? Um, a cool piece um, from Somatosphere, Intimate Connection, Singular Embodiments. I love it. Um, I also put in the chat a little bit ago um, a link from Northwestern about uh, Stephen uh, Thrasher talking about HIV and criminalization in 2019. We got another link in here from Mysoon, um, a statement from the Soros Foundation uh, from Open Society, 10 Reasons to Oppose the Criminalization of HIV. Perfect. Great. Good. Awesome stuff in here, guys. Um, yeah. Hot place <laughs> to visit some of these links. Um, as you get a chance to. We also have in the chat a link to Karma's book, um, as well as a link to um, Naomi Pike's book, um, Rightlessness, uh, which you referenced around Haitians and Guantanamo, if you wanna learn more there. And there's also a link to the accessibility copy if you wanna grab that before Karma takes it down um, <laughs> to, to um, get some of the things that Karma was speaking about that I know I couldn't write fast enough to sort of get at some of these ideas. So the beauty um, of accessibility copies. I just want to add one thing, Allie, just if there are some students that are still in the room. I always, whenever I do a talk in about a, a book I've written, um, I always tell students that, you know, if you really want the book, but it's not something you can afford, you can always send me an email um, and I'll get you a copy of the book. I love that. Okay. So students, I see you. I'm looking at your names. I won't call you out. Um, just pop me an email if you're interested, guys, and I will forward your info on. Um, you can also find Karma's email um, <laughs> pretty easily from UT and Boston's website. Yeah, I'm pretty, pretty <laughs> findable. <laughs> um, but if you'd rather go through me, I'm happy to do that too for you guys. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time. I said we'd take an hour and we took an hour. And I know I would love to keep talking, but I also know it's a Thursday night before spring break. And you guys, um, especially students, but also profs, you guys are dealing with midterms right now. So I want to be... Um, cautious around your time and leave you feeling excited and like you have a lot more questions to ask. Um, so you'll grab a copy of the book or email Karma um, with some of your questions and ideas. So for now, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you very much. Um, this has been sponsored by the Disability Studies Program at the University of Toledo, and we are thrilled to be able to invite Karma to speak about their book, um, The Borders of AIDS. So, um, and this will be posted on the College of Arts and Letters YouTube site as well, so we can share it widely with our students and Karma, hope, um, I'll try to remember to send you the link so you can also share it or save it for your records.
Awesome. Thank all you right, all so everybody. much. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you. Good to see you, Jim.